So prospect theory, this is a famous theory of Kahneman. We talk about bounded rationality. It's somewhat related to that, but it specifically looks at how do humans react when they're facing gains or losses. And what he discovered is the traditional theory, utility theory of economics doesn't have it right. Individuals put more weight on the pain of losing than they do the pleasure of winning. We are loss averse, but it gets further than that. This last few sentences here are really the key. We are risk averse when we are in a gain situation and we are risk seeking when we're facing losses. You've probably heard about this with stock portfolio managers that they'll sell their gains too quickly. So they're up 10%, so they sell. But if they've lost 10%, 20%, they cling on to the stock, hoping they'll get the gain back to become game gamblers. They might actually buy more stock, hoping that it will come back. You'll see that some when we do, when we do the case study on um, long-term capital management. Uh, when they were in a loss situation, they kept doubling down. Uh, so we tend to be risk-seeking when facing losses. We tend to, in a gain situation, we tend to really, really like the status quo. So loss aversion makes us love the status quo. Um, it's really interesting, some of the studies that he's done. Um, boy, it's um, one where he'll we'll take a class and he'll split them in half, and half of them he'll give a mug to. And the other half he'll give a t-shirt or a pin to. And what he'll discover is the people with the mugs will value mugs much more highly than t-shirts. And people with the t-shirts will value t-shirts much more highly than mugs. They found that people are, are so wedded to the status quo, where they are, they're so loss averse that they'll put great weight on where they are now. This has harmed people's careers. I know a lot of students who really should be changing jobs, our former students, they should be changing jobs. There's a better opportunity out there, but they see what they already have and they're scared to move because they're so scared to lose what they have, where the most rational decision is to go to that other job, to leave the firm. You really should set up into your, your psyche right now that the best thing for you to do is to change, is to change frequently move to other cities, move to other companies, move to new jobs, get as much experience as possible. But that loss adverse nature, when we have a gain, where we have some place where we are, boy, it makes us unable to move. But then when we have a loss, we tend to be very, very aggressive uh, on that side. And you'll see that uh, he gives an example with the divorce lawyers. Um, you know, the, the wealthier, the wealthier spouse would be much more aggressive because they have a lot to lose. Whereas the poor of the two uh, spouses will be much more loss averse, they're willing to settle and take less. And you know, it's interesting when you know that's the way people are. And politics is a big issue. Um, education reform. One of my students has done extremely well. He's really moving up fast in education reform. But it's a losing battle because teachers and teachers unions they have so much to lose that they they're they're extremely aggressive. Whereas the people who have gains, they're okay with the status quo. They're not willing to take risk, even though it'd be far better off for them to have some reform. And you just see that it, it keeps governments from moving, uh, keeps people from moving jobs. So it's it's a huge theory, and it's pretty important with with an understanding with how we how we actually behave and make decisions. <clears throat> the last of his theories, which I find the most interesting of all is this idea of experience versus memory. And that is, if you look back up above at the beginning part of Kahneman, I highly recommend you watch this TED Talk. It's a very, very good TED Talk. Um, it's not very lengthy. I think it's not even 20 minutes. Uh, I think you'll find it very, very insightful. But <clears throat> he contrasts experience versus memory of experiences. And he says, we don't make decisions based on our experiences. We make decisions based on the memory of our experiences. And there is a big difference between those two, amazingly. Um, <clears throat> there's a book that I found. I'm going to go on to Amazon.com. And there's a book I found. It's called On Being Certain. I'm not sure if I recommend it. 
I did like it. It was a little tedious in a few places, but very, very interesting book on what is it about the human psyche that we're absolutely sure we're right. I see this on Facebook. Uh, how many of my Facebook fit, uh, friends actually consider themselves omnipotent on certain issues, including issues where they have almost no training whatsoever? And that's the question he's asking. How do we become so certain about something where there's no rational reason for us to? And one of the things, I mean, no rational reason for us to be certain. And one of the things that he did, it was really interesting with the Challenger explosion. I think it was the Challenger. I may even remember. But, but um, so one of these space shuttles blows up, kills all the, uh, all the astronauts on it. Very big event. And there was a professor who was teaching right at that time, and he had a class the day after. So he had these students sit down and write in detail where they were, what they experienced, what they were thinking. He had them record that. And he went back a, just a couple of years later. We're not talking 20 years, 30 years later. Just a couple of years later, and he had those same students write down what they remembered, what were their experiences, where were they. And... They wrote down, and he was amazed how many people, well, two things that amazed them. The first thing was that their memories were wrong. What they remember today was very different. So we, our memories make, we make big mistakes. Now, I would tell you, I know exactly where I was when the Challenger exploded. I can even visualize it. I see myself exactly. I was a UT Austin student. I know exactly where I was walking, which sidewalk I was walking on. I remember hearing two students talking about it and hearing and thinking what a tragedy that is. After reading his book, I'm not so sure. If you talk to your grandparents and ask them where were they when President Kennedy was shot, they will tell you with absolute certainty exactly where they were and what they were thinking. I can think on 9-11, I have a very clear a memory of exactly where I was sitting. I was at USA. I know exactly what desk I was sitting at. But when he did this study, he discovered that people, their memories were wrong. But the second thing was, is they were certain their current memories were more accurate than what they wrote right after the event. That was an amazing finding that these people who wrote something the day after the Challenger event, you would think their memories would be absolutely perfect then, the day after. That that would be the correct memory. But he found that there is people who two or three years later wrote something very different. And not only that, but they're more confident that what they wrote two or three years later was more accurate than what they wrote the day after. Our memories are far less accurate than we think they are. And yet we're making decisions based on the memories of our experiences. I'm going to get into this more with uh, Annie Duke. She has this concept of time travel, which I think is so powerful for decision making. So we'll get into that a little more. It's a really incredible, incredible concept. <clears throat> so he talks about experiences versus memory. So we make decisions off the memories of our experiences, no matter how inaccurate they are. So remember back here, we talk about these two patients. And they're making decisions based on the memory of their experience, not based on the experience itself. The experience itself was actually much better for A than for B. But the memory of their experience, B thought it was a better experience than A, even though he suffered more pain for more time because the end of the experience was not nearly as painful as the middle. So he remembered more of the end than the beginning. And A, because his most painful was near the end of the experience, he, he did not like, he had a worse memory of the experience. I memory self is a storyteller. It doesn't re remember things based on actual data. It remembers things on what is easy for our brain to remember. So our brain captures things based on what's easier for it to collect and keep. Most of our experiences, 99.99% of our experiences are completely forgotten. What we remember is influenced by time and changes. And this, this is huge for me. I was asked to give the commencement address for the Honors College a few years ago, and I talked a little bit about this, how important it is change is to your life. That's why I say it's so critical that you set in your mind right now 
that you are going to change jobs frequently. I, I made a mistake on this, although I changed jobs pretty frequently at USA, but I stayed at USA. I probably switched, should have switched to another company. I just didn't have the confidence to do that. But I did switch a lot within USA and had a lot of experiences. But my memory of my life is based entirely on changes and experiences. That's why we remember so much more about our high school experience than we do with a 30 or 40 year career. Because high school, you had freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and each year was very different, different teachers, different classes, you're switching. There's so many changes that your brain has more to grab onto. And remember, so two week vacation on the beach will create no more memories than a two day vacation on the beach. And I, I've learned this, boy, it's my vacations, I make them as diverse and different as possible. I have one day in one city, one day in another city. I, I did a vacation where I rode my bike in 50, all 50 states. And every state was so different that I have very clear memories of almost every single state, even though it's two or three years ago. I remember Hawaii, Alaska, Iowa, Vermont, each has a very unique experience. So I've changed that with my vacations. People who go on vacation with me, boy, they hate it because, boy, we're doing so many different things. We're flying all over the place. My second vacation, Europe, boy, we're all over the place. But after the vacation, the people who went, that's like, wow, that was a great vacation because they have more memories that could capture more versus a two-week vacation on the beach. Um, our memory is very different than the experience itself, and that is what's going to make a decision. The experiencing self has no voice in the decision. I'll, I'll show you how I use this to help me uh, with staying fit and not even eating the wrong kind of foods. It, that has to do with the memory self versus the experiencing self. Mm. So we don't actually choose based on experiences. We choose based on memories of experiences. Mm. So we don't think of our futures... Um, our futures are not experiences, but rather anticipated memories. I have this typed wrong somehow. I have to somehow correct it. But, um, and so one of the questions he asked is a really interesting question is, let's, let's say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for a vacation. I'm going to let you go on a two-week vacation. You can do whatever you want to do. There's no limits. There's no budget rest restrictions. Even fine, famous people, you can do whatever you want if you want to learn to play tennis from John McEnroe uh, or Steffi Graf, or if you want to play, learn how to golf with Tiger Woods, or we want to do all of them. Two weeks, no, no expense. There's only one caveat. At the end of two weeks, we will erase all the memories of that vacation. You will have no memories, no photos, no journals. Nothing will come forward. You ask people what vacation do you want to do, and most people's answer is, well, if there's no memories, I don't care. When you get to the idea that the reason you're going on vacation is not for the experiences, but in order to create the memories of the experiences, boy, you change how you do vacations. When you realize your job selection and your career selection is not to have experiences, but rather to create memories of experiences, then you start changing things quite a bit. So I encourage students in their first jobs, make that experience as diverse as possible. Be very, very careful of your day being monotonous. Go do different things. In fact, I encourage students because there's there is the networking benefit and an, a memory benefit of every day, go on break with a different person. Don't get stuck with the same. Go up to someone and say, hey, I'm, I'm trying to meet people in this company. I want to hear about their lives and their experiences and their jobs. Maybe take a buddy with you so that maybe it doesn't seem too awkward that maybe you know people think you have other m motivations and just say, hey, I want to hear about all about your job. Would you be willing to go on break with me today? Most people would love that, a chance to talk about themselves. They would love it, have the experience of just to find a way to break up, add a lot of variety to your life. Um, but, but just realize your experiencing self and your memory self are very, very different. Uh, and how that influences you. <clears throat> so Taleb also has a quote that agrees with that. Um, here's what Taleb said. It comes out of Black Swan. Your happiness depends more on the number of positive feelings. What psychologists, cause po psychologists call positive effect than on the intensity. In other words, good news is new good news first. How good matters rather little. So to have a pleasant life, you need to spend 
spread those small effects across time as evenly as possible. So let me give you an example of this, and I've seen this with students. So let's say your first job, you're making $40,000. And so your living standard is 40000 And then you get a raise to 70000 And this is what students do. Their living standard, they shift it, goes to 70000 That's a huge mistake. You shouldn't do that. What you should do is increase your living standard to 50000 And then a few years later to 60000 Now your raise now might be 90000 But slowly increase over time. So this would be good. Same thing with cars. You can afford a $20,000 car and then suddenly you can afford a $50,000 car. Don't buy it. Buy the $30,000 car and then buy the 40. Spread these out over your life you'll be far, far, far better off at the end of your life because you're, you'll have more pleasant experiences. Uh, there's an example Taylor gives of a lawyer making 900,000 bucks and his wife complained about how poor they were. Now, how in the world can someone making $900,000, how can his spouse be saying we're too poor? And the reason was they lived in a neighborhood, oh, I can't spell that word, neighborhood where people were making $1.4 million. So they felt poor because they were living in a neighborhood where people made a lot more money than they did. What they should have done is they should have moved to a, a, a place, <laughs> I'll avoid the word neighborhood, where people make $300,000. And they would have felt incredibly rich, incredibly advantageous. Now, I'm the extreme case of this. I can tell you I was making, you know, six high six digits, seven digit salaries. And I was living in neighborhoods where people were making forty and fifty thousand. So I went to the extreme. I was making fifteen, twenty, thirty times more than most of the people around me. I felt incredibly rich. Something would come up that cost five or six thousand dollars, a big deal, just write a check. And I was living around people that a bill would come up costing four hundred dollars and they were panicking. They were like, How are we gonna handle this? I just felt incredibly rich. I could spend my money on experiences, I could take, you know, fifteen people on a cruise. I could go take 10 people to New York City. I could do things like that that I found much more valuable than being a bunch around a bunch of snobby people living in million dollar homes. I'm glad I chose to do that, but that was an extreme case. But I will encourage you. I mean, this is an important part of how the human brain works, how we're satisfied with life, how we view our lives, that we sit at the end of our lives and look over it, back over it. There's a lot that Taleb's saying here that I think will incredibly change your life and your outcome. That's why, and that's that commencement address is add variety to your, to your life and spread it out over your life. Don't increase your living standard just because your, your pay went up. Set money aside. Give yourself a chance to change jobs. You know, save money. You get a raise. Keep your living standard the same. Save up so that that big opportunity comes to work for a startup. You can quit your job. Your salary goes from 100000 to 20000 But you have this startup that you believe in that could make you a billionaire, and you're ready to go for it. So I, I encourage you. I've had students come back to me years later and say, Professor, I got this $80,000 car. I got this mortgage. What do I do? I don't like my job, but I can't afford a switch. And in my, my opinion, is it's too late. You messed up. You, over, you, you, you try to load up your good experiences. You try to front load them rather than spreading them out. And it, it, to me, it was a disaster. So with that, you know, soapbox, and it sounds like your uncle giving you advice, but I do very much believe in it. I encourage you to read through that and think what it means for your career. It's a good time to stop and think about these type of things.